We all want everyone here to participate in this conversation, so here's a number where you can text in your questions, and we'll try to get to those towards the end of this talk. Uh, but as you guys are kind of percolating and thinking about some of those things, I want to engage with you in a conversation. Right. Now, I, I think one of the first things that you said, you were like, you know, we have to go to the ancient to look for the modern. I was like, what does that even mean? And then, then I looked at my outfit, and I was like, well, I've got the ancient tweed pastor jacket with the modern sneakers. Dude, so I am like, all okay. about this. Okay, I, you so are I get it. ancient future faith right here. I get it. Um, no, but I really appreciated your talk and also uh, the book uh, that you. you're writing. And um, the title is on, on the Road with Augustine. And as I was just kind of reading a little bit about my, my background, um, I'm a pastor at Redeemer Downtown, and uh, I worked in finance before this. I uh, had immigrant parents, moved here to, uh, to the United States with lots of ambition, and uh, went and did it. And sort of much like Augustine, kind of, I guess, came to the end of myself mm, mm, um, mm. and really found, you know, really a relationship with Jesus to be the thing. Mm, mm. Now, so much like Augustine, I also went into ministry because he became a bishop, right? But I don't think what you're saying, nor what Augustine is saying, is, okay, now, therefore, turn your ambition into going into ministry. Right. That's not godly ambition. No. So kind of flesh that out for us a little yeah, bit. Yeah, no, this, yeah, thank you. That, that's really important. What, what it, in, in Augustine's case, it was discerning this particular call in his life, and he kind of went into it kicking and screaming in, in a sense. I think what Augustine's saying is now... Uh, um, all of us have such an array of vocations in, in the diversity of God's good creation. And it's m not a matter of like leaving worldly secular uh, uh, work for the sake of holy sacred work. He, he deconstructs that whole dichotomy. It's more like how can I now pursue my calling, my profession, my vocation in a way that I'm not over expecting from it mm. would be the, the sort of sanctified way of doing it. But also in a way that is faithful to what God is hoping for from that sector of his creation, in a sense, right? So answering that call. Hmm. Um, that is uh, really great, and now we're going to go, and we're going to say, okay, that's exactly what we're going to do. Yeah. But then we're going to go, and, it, and it's not going to happen, right? So I think a lot of times for us what happens mm. is we know mm. that we ought to be humble and do things for the Lord in, in one sense of our minds, and... We kind of think ambition is maybe bad or negative, mm. and I actually like how you de-demonized yeah. it. Yeah, good. But um, I guess for, what happened with Augustine where that mental knowledge, I mean, we, we preach about this and talk about this all the time, that you're accepted by God, you don't have to do this for your, for your self-worth, and then we go out into the week and kind of act the same way. So what, maybe through Gust, Augustine's story, what happened to him? What did he experience? How did that shift and really change to transform his life? Well, and maybe... Um, I hope this is what you were asking. I, I mean, I think that it's twofold. On the one hand, I think Augustine says you kind of have to be aware of the currents of the world that you swim in and realizing that there are sort of competing habit-forming rituals and cultures in our professional lives mm -hmm. and to just sort of open our eyes and realize, okay, I might be confidently stepping into the world of finance or law or art or whatever it might be, and I actually want to, you know, do faithful work for the sake of the world in that space. But I also have to realize I, I'm swimming in water that is, you know, there's a current there that might be going in a different direction. So it's awareness of that. And then, to be honest, I think Augustine thinks, Look, learning to love God and pursue our vocations in this way takes practice. Hmm. You, you ha we have to embed ourselves in the community of practice because this isn't just learning the right ideas or learning to think the right things about our work or our calling. It's also learning to love the right things and want the right things. And that's really about the formation of spiritual habits. Mm -hmm. And it's why Augustine thinks, in a sense, the center of every Christian's life uh, is sort of the hub of the body of Christ, mm -hmm. which is where we are apprenticing our hearts to God's story so that that over time, we hope, becomes the, the sort of orienting story that governs our work. And you have to keep cycling mm -hmm. back into that story because when we answer the call to go out and be faithful in the world, we have to realize we're always kind of being apprenticed by competing stories. So you have to do the corrective. Does that, does that make mm. sense? Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's great. 
Um, and I do think that a lot of times, especially with my background, coming from an immigrant family, wanting to be ambitious, uh, ambition kind of goes toward the uh, secular world, mm. and the sacred mm. is kind of set apart. Mm. And Augustine is sort of saying, no, you, you, you need to kind of be reoriented through it all. So I wonder if us practicing that is not necessarily just in a gathered worship setting, yep. but we actually need to practice that more out in the scattered world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I, mean I think this is something that actually... Redeemer has always sort of championed is also imagining what does it look like for us mm -hmm. to kind of cultivate practices in our professional environments that will also orient us in, in kingdom-oriented ways, mm -hmm. right? Um, I also think it's, it's about learning, you know, one of the themes I talk about in the book is friendship is absolutely crucial and non-negotiable in Augustine's vision of what a whole and full and meaningful life looks like. And I, I think what we realize is you can't just be this lone ranger out there. Um, you have to be embedded in communities of friendship and, and finding those in our professional lives uh, is, uh, goes a long way to sustaining us, I think, in our call to be there. Hmm. Um, you just used the word call. Yeah. And... Uh, as a pastor of Redeemer Downtown, where we meet with a lot of uh, young, um, ambitious types, the question that we get a lot is, what is my calling? My job isn't fulfilling. This mm. isn't what I thought mm. it would be. Mm. Uh, am I called to something else? What am mm. I called to? You, you talk a little bit about calling your freedom chapter that I thought was really interesting. So maybe uh, unpack calling for us a little bit, because I think yeah. that undergirds a lot of this. And I mean, I, I don't, I, I'd be interested to hear your pastoral experience too. Because, oh, well, I'll give it to you. you know, I'll give it to you. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Because I mean, one thing that worries me a little bit, and you know, I teach at a university, a Christian university, and so we, we talk about this in ways in which we tend to assume that people get to always have these wonderful, meaningful jobs that are the exact expression of their gifts and things. Right. Whereas, right. look, that's a luxury in many mm -hmm. ways. And so I, I think discerning a sense of calling is, it looks like, uh, um, you know, the, the very particularity of how God has made me and knows me in discernment with community, trying to figure out what are the gifts and strengths I have? What are the things that come easily to me? What, what, do, what brings me joy? What does the world need? This is Beekner's famous quote. But, and then what does it look like to be faithful when I don't get to run the world the way I want to, which is 97.8% of the time. Mm. And, and to know that faithfulness is in a sense more significant than even, we can have a little bit of a cult of creativity sometimes that mm -hmm. again is a little bit of a luxury compared to what a lot of, how a lot of people have to spend their day. And I think uh, journeying with one another can be a way of uh, reminding ourselves that there, there are modes of faithfulness in our work that won't always look like, um, won't always look distinctive maybe. Does that, does that resonate with what, people's experience in your congregation? Um, a little, but mo more so what you wrote in your book that you said how um, we have now become our own caller mm. in a sense, mm. right? And mm. we're kind of always mm. out for mm. authenticity. Gotcha. And yes. so that, you know, I see yes. a lot of bit of yes. that. Like, yes. I don't feel that fulfillment in yes. sort of a fleeting thing that we're chasing, yes. you know? So we almost kind of fetishize our getting to determine our own end. Yeah, so this, for Augustine, there's, there's two fundamentally different ways to think about freedom. And in our cultural moment in late modernity, for the most part, we can only think about freedom in a very narrow and negative way, is the way he would put it, which is freedom is autonomy. Freedom mm -hmm. is independence. Freedom is me being lord and master of myself. Right. And he actually gives the diagnosis about why that probably a recipe for profound disappointment. <laughs> Whereas true freedom is actually finding the end for which you were made and being empowered mm. to answer that mm. call. That it's something outside of myself. And, and listen, in, in the United States, I think it is just a profoundly countercultural idea to still imagine that I exist as a human being for the sake of others. Mm. That it's actually not about me. 
um, that is at the heart of what Augustine thinks being a creature is. To love God and love neighbor means that in many ways, what's most important is outside of me. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, I'm curious what you or Augustine, as a guy who, who has followed Augustine, what would uh, ambitious, godly life look like then? Because I, I, some of the questions that we're getting is, uh, I think the modern church is very afraid to be ambitious yeah. for yeah. fear of falling into some worldly idea of ambition. Yeah. So what does that look like? So I, I think, it, um, and by the way, you can be, to be ambitious is not the same as gaining notoriety, right? There's, there's, in some cases, some people will have both a particular calling, an exceptional set of gifts, and will be answering a call at a strategic moment such that they sort of rise to prominence and we see them. And for that person, that's what faithful ambition looks like. And, and for us, for the church, I, I, think it is, I think it is as sinful, just as being narcissistic and self-interested and thinking this is about my getting attention is sinful, it is equally sinful for the church to kind of sit back on its laurels and lop off the heads of all the poppies, as, as C.S. Lewis once put it, and have this leveling effect and say, you're getting too big for your britches, son, you know? And that's, that's, that is equally unfaithful, it seems to me. What, what I think ambition looks like is being, in a way, deadly serious <laughs> about realizing all of your potential mm. and, and, the, and realizing what you are responsible for and seeing it come to flourishing, but doing so with a very open hand mm. and, and holding it lightly mm. so that loss would not devastate you. Uh, if, if, if loss utterly devastates you. And that's actually several of Augustine's meditations in the, in the confessions are about his experience of being so devastated by loss. That's a sign that you're holding it too tightly mm. and it's not gift anymore. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, I know I'm a philosopher, so I'm a little comfortable with abstractions. Is that, is that helpful? I hope that's helpful to the questioner. Yeah, and, um, and I think something that was really comforting to me is that Augustine, he admits in his book, too, that even as a pastor now who's had these realizations, he continues to struggle. Now, I never do that, but uh, Augustine, I'm sure, he yeah, yeah, struggled, yeah, yeah. right? So I never, I never struggle with yeah. rightly or wrong, yeah, wrong uh, ambitions. But, um, yeah, I do think should... a lot of times we, we think, oh, I've got it now. The struggle ends. I've yeah. got ambition. But, you know, even Augustine yeah. struggles with that. Paul the Apostle struggles with yes. that. In the book of Romans. So, um, how did, I guess, how did Augustine stay in the struggle? Now, maybe you might say practices, but are there some things from his life that helped him remain in the struggle? I would also say his friendships. So, mm -hmm. in other words, he, he stays in it because his friendships are the ones who are telling him, hey, Augie, man, your head is getting way too big. Augie, you know, like, huh? like, like, <laughs> Olypius. Olypius is this lifelong friend that he has. And when you read his, their letters back and forth, you can see them sort of. Uh, rubbing off each other's rough edges kind of thing. And I think remaining embedded in community and remaining vulnerable to critique from sisters and brothers who are journeying with us is, is a really important part of that. Mm. Um, I do think the liturgical practice of confession mm. is relevant here. Do you know what I mean? Like, to me, it's liberating to say, hey, Jamie, why did you write this book? To serve uh, uh, the world or to get attention? Yes. <laughs> and, and, to, and to say, I don't want to be the guy who needs the attention. I don't want to be the guy who's like refreshing his Amazon account every 15 mm. minutes. Uh, um, uh, and yet I also rest in, as, as you say, when someone like Augustine admits it, you sort of rest in and say, okay, mm. I have a long, this is a long road, <laughs> and I have a lot of growing to do. And in a way, this is a school of formation that you never graduate from. Mm. And in fact, what Christian maturity often looks like is realizing the other dark corners of my heart that God hasn't even got to yet. Mm. Um, and not being afraid of that, to realize that I'm in Christ. <laughs> and so it, it wasn't predicated on any illusion of purity to start with. Mm. Yeah, I think um, some of the things that Augustine talks about a lot for him to have this experience is that he comes to the end of himself. And when yes. you read the confession, he's so introspective and he's so personal and he's so in tune 
with his desires, and I don't think that that's our no. common experience. No. Right. Um, help us. Yeah. How might we, as a culture, uh, people today in New York, get there? Yeah, I, I think you're so right, David. That in a way, the, the way that Augustine kind of jackhammers into his own soul mm. and can, like, ha the self knowledge he has is not common. Right. It's not. Now, and, and by the way, we also live in a culture which has entire industries which are designed to distract us from exactly that kind of introspection. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? To numb us so that we don't face ourselves in, in a way. Pascal said, you know, one of the greatest horrors of any human being is to be left in a room alone. That's why we invented phones, so you never have to be alone. Mm. You never have to tell. The catalyst for Augustine, one of the catalysts for Augustine was philosophy. <laughs> so, uh, um, From a guy who teaches philosophy. Yes, yeah, yeah. Right. So this, sure, this, is, this sure. is why philosophy is required of every li good liberal arts degree. Because it's, it's supposed to be a catalyst. Now, in another way, this is actually why Augustine writes his confessions. Mm. The, he only tells his story because he thinks it is a human story. And he, what he genuinely hopes is that some Dartmouth frat boy picks up the confession somehow and is sort of faced with but it would still be kind of miraculous, but basically pauses and says, huh, I have never asked myself, what do I want? I've never really sort of peered inward. So Augustine's confessions can be that. I do think that this is kind of what good mission and ministry looks like in mm. our cultural moment. Mm. In, in a way, it's almost like a prelude to the gospel, a preamble to faith, is I would love it if our churches could mm. be denumbing stations of, of uh, uh, introspective wake-up call yeah. so that uh, one of the gifts that we actually give to people who, who come and entertain our communities is we force them to become face-to-face -face with themselves. And um, I, I do think that's sort of the beginning of grace in wow. a way. Yeah. Wow, that's great. That's great. Um, there's a ton of great questions coming in. Uh, I'm going to start asking some, but we're going to do something that we normally don't do, okay. but because you're so great on your feet, okay. we're going to actually open it up to some live right. questions uh, on the mic. So if you would be so bold to ask a question to philosopher Jamie Smith, uh, there's a mic up here, but uh, as you're kind of mustering your, your courage, I've got some questions that we've okay. got texted in uh, as well. And this, this was a great one. What is the relationship between ambition and contentment, right? So, for example, mm, Paul says mm. that we should make it our ambition to live a, a quiet life in 1 Thessalonians 4.11. I've not cross-referenced that text, so I'm not sure <laughs> if it's exactly what it is, but that's what yeah, the question yeah. was. So. That's a great question. I, I actually yeah. think uh, um, it gets at the heart of something that Augustine is interested in, which is um, holy, let's call it holy ambition, sanctified ambition for Augustine is aspiring to realize both the fullness of the gifts that God has given me, but also the fullness of the potential that's been folded into God's creation and bringing that to fruition. So in a sense, um, I can do both of those things, it's, it seems to me, with a contentment about... Um, you know, I can hold those, I can hold my accomplishments lightly and realize that in this long sojourn of this veil of tears in which we are waiting for the kingdom to come, loss is also a reality. So the test, a little bit like we mentioned before, the test is can you achieve and lose mm. and still rest mm. and trust God? Um, uh, Contentment doesn't, I, I, I also think contentment is not the same thing as of achieving placidity. It's not static. I don't think contentment is static. Uh, I, I think it is a way of being, a state of being in that regard. Yeah, mm. it's a great question. It deserves a lot more reflection. Yeah. I think we've got a question up front. Yeah, go ahead and approach yeah. the mic. Brave soul, thank you for being number one. Uh, thank you for uh, coming and speaking tonight. I, so you quoted a, a poet, I can't remember his name. Um, Scott Cairns probably. Uh, probably, um, but you s <laughs> uh, the quote was, if we're not called to uh, greatness, we're not called to anything. Yeah. Um, do you, like, I guess, juxtapose the, the use of greatness there 
uh, with the use of, of excellence, sort of from the like the virtue ethic, like arete, um, is that are those different or are those the same? In, in yeah, no, no, no. I I, th I think that's really suggestive. I mean, Scott's being kind of intentionally provocative there, right? So, uh, um, I think greatness um, is scalable. And so excellence is probably actually a better way. And what is excellence? Excellence is the realization of what this thing or person was made for. And in that sense, excellence is always relative to the individual and the thing and the end. And so in that sense, you can say not, greatness does not always look like getting a stained glass window or getting your novels in you know, the modern library. It, it can also look like uh, grandchildren that still remember how faithfully you prayed because in that life lived you realized everything God had called you to you were you had achieved excellence in your vocation so I think that's important that's a helpful um, clarification really yeah thank you yeah and, and as a follow-up to that one question that we got in was uh, you talk about uh, in our modern dates either win or quit right with yeah. uh, with uh, Agassiz um, what's the alternative then if it's not win or quit it's, it's that um, you can still aspire and the point isn't domination. Mm. You can still aspire and accomplish, but the point of your uh, accomplishment wasn't to get attention, it wasn't to win, it wasn't, it wasn't just, in some ways, I think it's so hard for us to think about ambition outside of a competition framework. But that's really for us to have been suck suckered by kind of late modern capitalism. And that's not a critique of capitalism. It's just saying now you're letting a sort of capitalist ethos shape the very way you think of intersubjectivity as a whole. And so what we're talking about is a mode of imagining faithful aspiration and achievement mm -hmm. that is not a zero-sum game and isn't exclusive. My achieving is not at the expense of your losing. Mm -hmm. And, and it also isn't, it means you don't want to believe what Ricky Bobby believed, which is if you're not first, you're last, yeah. right? That's a lie. That's a lie. It's about faithfulness. Uh, and that seems like a different angle. Yeah, and it reminds me of uh, the uh, J.R. Tolkien uh, story, Leaf by Niggle. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Like, uh, you can't finish it all here, so you don't get depressed, but there's something of a true reality to that work that we're doing here that will last forever. We're a part of that. That. And whatever leaf that we can kind of spit out here yes. is still a part, still that beautiful, is still. Yeah. Uh, question up front. Hi there. Thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering how you can um, entertain or accept loss when you are positing that um, the goal is to take your gifts very seriously um, mm. and actualize them. Yeah. Yeah. Th this is where um, Augustine is. Um, Augustine is not a prosperity preacher, and so what I mean by that is Augustine knows that the world we live in is broken and fallen, and uh, um, lapsed, and so what that means is there is a kind of insecurity that characterizes this long journey through the veil of tears that is this mortal life. And so what that means is we have to be prepared for the tragic, for the unjust in a way. And it's why the response, you know, the ambition theme is not the only theme in this book. It's actually one theme. And another important theme in the book is lament. Mm. Learning to lament is a very, very important habit and practice for a people who live in a world that's not yet kingdom come. <laughs> Every day we pray the Lord's Prayer and say, thy kingdom come, it's a reminder that it's not here yet. And that's why he thinks there's an insecurity that characterizes uh, our, our, our journey, our pilgrimage, our sojourn. In fact, one of the other core concepts I try to develop in the book is what I call Augustine's refugee spirituality. That is, he thinks that the human, all humans are cosmic emigres mm. who are actually on their way to finding their home in a country they've never been to. And when you see this theme and thread in Augustine's work, now what you realize is, oh, that, that's why vulnerability 
is kind of built into the human condition as well. And it's taking that seriously. Yeah. So I, I want to I wanna just watch our time, but I saw three brave souls come up to the front. So if you could maybe keep your questions short and then also your answers brief so that okay. we can get these all in. Sorry. That'd be great. This is a bit of a you, theme with you, David, yeah, but sorry, anyway, yeah. You know, we gave you an inch and you took a mile, so now <laughs> we got to just... Uh, really appreciate what you said, but um, not. But. but. And. See? And. You see that? And. <laughs> You mentioned churches should be denumbing stations, yeah, I believe. you know what I mean. Um, therefore, I should, my bottom line question is, how am I, how do I give good input to other people about their ambition? Mm, how mm, am I, mm, not yeah. how do I get it, because I don't think I get always good input, people misjudge, or, Sure. Yeah. that's my evaluation, but how am I a good uh, reflection, a mirror for people. That's great. That's good. Um, I, I think this, and this is very much bound up with what Augustine thinks it means to be a good friend. And in a way, I would think one of the best gifts you can give to people as a mentor, as a friend in this regard, is to get them to face a question that they probably hardly ever ask themselves is, what do I want when I want to win? <laughs> what, what, I, I think getting to this the kind of introspection that we hardly ever get to. So getting past just, oh, how can I succeed? That's a different kind of question. That's already assuming a bunch of things. Getting them to the more fundamental question, which is, what do I want when I want to achieve? And we don't have to answer that question for them. It's just getting them to ask the question for themselves that I think is really important. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, Maybe answer this question with lament, but um, does everyone have a calling? Is an ambition only possible for people who have a choice? Great question. So I think that everyone has a calling, and I don't mean to be cheeky or overly pious when I say this, and that calling is to be a friend of God. So in that sense, that is the most fundamental calling. And then every other aspect of what I might be aspiring to has to be sort of ranked in relationship to that. I also think that Augustine imagines that human beings are made to be agents, to have agency, to have freedom. Now, what we sometimes don't appreciate enough, though, is how much systems and structures often compress, constrict, take away de-agentify people's situations. And that's when, that's when I get worried about the language of calling, especially in sort of faith and work discussions, that gets set up in such a way that imagines people have agency that they don't really have in their work. And now Augustine still thinks, I am free. This is like, uh, uh, um, never mind, the guy who wrote, um, <laughs> oh, it's going to bug me. But uh, um, you still have a kind of freedom and agency uh, uh, to answer this call to be a friend with God, but I think we should do a better job of being uh, sensitive to the systemic dynamics of what it looks like in our work world. Does that sound fair? Yeah, yeah, great. Last question. I hope it's a good one. Yeah. Um, so Bring it home, bring it home. <laughs> bringing it, looking at this from a new framework, I really like your framework for for viewing ambition. So I was trying to think through some of the biblical characters. And mm. immediately I thought of Paul, who the yeah. Bible always thought was a little arrogant. So <laughs> yeah. I thought, yeah, he's ambitious. But then yes. looking at it from this light, he's actually ambitious. I'm not sure he was arrogant or not. But, but then I, what about Christ? I thought he was certainly ambitious. And are there any signs of ambition in God, the Father and the Holy Spirit? Mm. Mm. <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, I, that's a fascinating <laughs> question. I haven't... Um, that's a good, so that's a good place to end You've with my being sentence. humiliated. <laughs> um, I, 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 I would say this, so that's, that's be fascinating to think about. Um, I think you're right, by the way, that we, we so associate ambition with arrogance that we also confuse false humility. <laughs> as if it were virtuous, mm. and it's not. I think what, what, we, what we often react negatively to in people who we write off, like a Paul who's such a giant, and then we think, oh, he must be arrogant, is all we mean is he doesn't exhibit the false humility we expect of people. Mm. Whereas Paul himself, I've always thought it's a remarkable uh, uh, 
I won't remember the verse either, but somewhere he says, you know, do not think too highly of yourself. But that also means do not think too lowly of yourself. <laughs> uh, there's no virtue in that. And I think that hitting that sweet spot is the challenge in a way. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit helps us. Uh, that's all I got. And on that note, with the Holy Spirit helping us, uh, let's thank Jamie thank for you. being here with us. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, and I, I think you're going to stick around upstairs yes. for a cocktail so yes. the questions can continue to come. But uh, before we close and before we have Scott come back up, we'd love for you to maybe just pray for us and close us oh, out if you'd sure. like. Yeah, yeah, that'd be absolutely. great. Let's pray. Lord God, how remarkable that we could be friends with the creator of the universe who knows everything about us and still loves us. So we give you thanks for the gifts that you've given each one here. We give you thanks for all the many ways that you are calling us. We pray for um, liberation from the idols of achievement and domination and attention and empowerment to pursue you and to pursue our callings in such a way that we can inspire with a holy ambition so that we can bear witness to what you want for your world, that we can be ambitious for the sake of others and the causes of justice and mercy. We pray that you will send us here from this night with a sense of your continued partnership, friendship, that you are the God who journeys with us and will never leave us nor forsake us, and that we can rest in you, a Sabbath everlasting. We pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.